Jericho. On the 18th of June 1984, in the course of the year-long national miners strike, police and miners clashed at Orgreave coking plant in South Yorkshire. Miners were assaulted and arrested for rioting. On the 1st of June 1985, on the way to a People's Free Festival, police and travellers clashed in a bean field near Stonehenge in Wiltshire. 420 people were arrested and homes and property were wrecked. As a result of these events, both miners and travellers took civil action against the police in an attempt to gain compensation for assault, false imprisonment, malicious prosecution and damage to property. Earlier in 1991, both of these cases came to a conclusion. In Operation Solstice and Battle for Orgreave, tonight's critical eye asks whether the actions of the police, judiciary and state pose a fundamental threat to civil liberties. What this trial is about is claims for uh, false imprisonment, assault and damage to property and uh, the main issues are were the police entitled to make the arrests that they did make on the 1st of June 1985, particularly the arrests of these 26 plaintiffs. Uh, if they were, did they use unlawful force in making those arrests and did they commit uh, acts of unlawful damage to people's vehicles and property both at the time of the arrests and later. There are 150 vehicles behind me. The women and children have been left at Savanac Forest. They're all heading for Stonehenge. That's 18 miles away. I wasn't aware of it at the time that it took place, but I later became aware that really the whole of the Wiltshire establishment had sat down to decide what to do about the convoy. And this involved various landowners and the county council and the police and their solicitors. And it was a question really for them that they didn't want these people coming into Wiltshire and occupying the area around Stonehenge, but there wasn't really a law that enabled them to keep the convoy out. So it was a question of taking advice to find some kind of legal cloak to throw around the operation which they wanted to launch. And so they came up with this business of the civil injunctions to justify uh, all that then happened. And it, it seems to me still highly questionable whether what happened was really lawful. We are prepared for any contingency which may arise and although I've told you how many men I've got available, I've also got maximum cooperation of my neighbouring chief constables that they're prepared to assist me if I require that aid. I think a few people were aware of this thing called a High Court injunction, um, but people just felt that if they did come across the police that probably they would be advised or forcefully told to go somewhere else and that that's what they would do and then everything would still be all right. But Nobody had the slightest idea of the, the ambush, capture and violence that was, uh, was intended.
sort of alert and thinking, well, what's going to happen now, you know, and I just watched them go down the side of the vehicle up ahead, and I could see this going as they were coming down the side, and I'm thinking, oh, well, you know, for crying out loud, what's going on here? Wait, 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 wait. I went, no, and screamed at him, just tell me what you want me to do. And I reached all over the windscreen like this, because he was there first, and then he was hitting there, and, and then this one here was hitting at the window, and I put my hands up against the window here, and I said, just tell me what you want me to do. And there's a crash and a bang and a wallop from behind me, and there's shouting, and they're banging on the sides of the ambulance, and they're shouting. One of the police reached in through that broken side window, the passenger window, um, and grabbed a handful of hair. Um, I couldn't see clearly into the vehicle from where I was standing. Uh, I was some little distance off, but it was very clear to me that he had hold of the top of her hair and was pulling very vigorously. Uh, she, of course, was screaming blue murder, not wanting to be pulled, because what she was being pulled through was a window that had been broken ten seconds earlier, which was framed as broken glass. We knew there would be a confrontation. Um, I'm hoping that we'll get through the day without too many people being injured, either policemen or peace convoy, or the people in the field. Has the operation gone as you expected? Yes, I think so. When you're ready, lift. Ready? Yeah. Bastards. Bastards. No, no, you're out there. Fucking watch you, miss. Find the barbed wire. Take care of them now. Is this the one that was kicking up on the road? Stonehenge was just the excuse. They knew how strongly we all felt about Stonehenge and knew that was a good reason. But the real reason was the, the threat to the state. As I said, the, the growth of people, the numbers of people was doubling every year. For four years, well, that was a huge number of people that was suddenly flocking into buses or whatever and living on the road. And the festival itself, once it became to be a month long, it functioned perfectly well. It had its own economy, it had its own system for everything and was so successful in that sense that it must have been a huge threat to the state. It was anarchy in action and it worked and it was seen to be working and it was seen to be working by so many people that they wanted to do it too and wanted to be a part of it. We haven't done anything, have we? Going on on the just now. trying just to live our lives, lives at yeah, all. We don't need to fear of anyone yeah. else. Yeah. You know? And this world's supposed to be a common treasury for everybody to share, not yeah, people to free button land. up. Sure. You know what I mean? No wonder people are starting to get sick. These people are pushing our people too close. And like, it's going to start to explode one of these days if they don't this, watch this it. This whole thing here is just a total farce. Cities are going crazy, everybody's going crazy. It's all because of this. They're trying to, trying to impose a police state. Well, we're free thinkers and we're going to stay that way, well, no matter what. Well, they got to tell us what Whether to do. Whether they shoot me or not, I don't care. Yeah. They can go for it. Why don't you go to hospital? Well, we don't want to be split up. We, we don't want to be arrested. I'm not going to leave my husband, my dog, my puppies and my home. Like, we don't want to be arrested. If we leave here, we'll get arrested and split up. She'll be taken one place, I'll be taken another. We'll probably lose our home. Like, we'll, we'll have no livelihood, nowhere to live. We just want to get off this field as peacefully and quietly as we can. And this lot, all these coppers are just here for one reason, and that's to cause trouble. I mean, I don't want to cause trouble. I ain't going to cause trouble. I ain't got a stick or anything. They just want to go. Just go quiet, so the baby gonna be born. I have a decent start in life, not surrounded by a thousand coppers with sticks and shields. Eventually, uh, this dreadful man, Lionel Grundy, the, who was then the assistant chief constable, arrived on the scene and made it quite clear uh, that there were to be no negotiations and that everybody in the field was to be what he called arrested and processed. Those of you that, that come out under those circumstances will be interviewed and dealt with. In other words, you'll be locked up and dealt with. Yeah. If, if I suspect that you've been involved in some of the offences that have occurred today, then you would be arrested. Well, that, that's it. Now, wait a minute. I'm not, I'm not here to bargain with you. I'm here to say something, something to you for you to consider. Now, you don't have to make an answer now. You can get through to me. Now, we want to go to Stonehenge. 
Well, the Stonehenge Festival, as you oh, know, has been cancelled this year. And somebody, it wasn't me, said, well, that's crazy. If you had a couple of football hooligans in a football stadium, you wouldn't arrest everybody in the stadium just to get at the hooligans. But he wasn't interested uh, in making any distinction between those he alleged had actually committed offences and the rest. He wanted everybody. You had no right to stop us coming in this field. We're not at Stonehenge. What's your reaction to what that police officer has asked you to do? Well, I'm well upset about it. I mean, he's offered us naff all. Absolutely nothing. We'd like this alternative site if they say we can't have this one. We would like the alternative. They're, what they're asking us to do is hand ourselves into custody like we did at Nostal Priory and get ourselves fitted up on charges that we don't want. They fitted us up, loads of us, last year. Nobody's done anything about it. Now they're about to start doing it again. And we need help. That's all we fucking We're genuine wrong. people just like We're yourselves, and we side. need help right now. Yeah. Please, you help us, you all of you. Help us, stand by us. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. attacking the bus and they were hit, hitting the window, the driver's window, with an iron spike about four foot long or so, half an inch wide. I thought it was a fencing stake to start with but it, it wasn't, it was too big for that, more like a crowbar. And eventually it did go through and as I, the windscreen which had been caving in finally broke and I oh. went back and sort of went like that because of the, the glass flying over and the spike came through the window and it was definitely quite frightening. They smashed me windows, they hit me on the entry truncheons, they hit me when I was on the floor! Just as they'd got me onto the brow of the hill there, because uh, that's where they, they was taking this old particular lot that was left. Uh, this bobby, these bobbies stopped me and s forcibly spun me round and made me look. They said, "See that?" And I looked at my home, and there was smoke coming out the out the side doors, and they'd gone and set my home on fire and and stopped me and turned me round made me look at my home, the flames coming and the smoke coming out the sides. When that boat is stopped, make sure the driver is well identified. Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! 
national and international year. What we, the ITN camera crew, and myself as a reporter have seen in the last 30 minutes here on this field has been some of the most brutal police treatment of people I've witnessed in my entire career as a journalist. There must be an inquiry. I don't know what the results will be of it, but at this stage, the number of people who've been hit by policemen who've been clubbed whilst holding babies in their arms and in coaches around this field is still to be counted. What the end result will be, we don't know, but there must surely be an inquiry after what's happened here today. When I got back to ITN during the following week and I went, I went to the library to look at all of the, the rushes, most of what I thought we'd shot was no longer there. And from what I've seen of, of what ITN has provided since then, it disappeared, and particularly some of the the nastier uh, shots that were taken of the battle in the main field of, of the woman being dragged out by her hair, whom I know was filmed. took an important stand on the very first or the second day of the case when the press started calling this the hippie trial and that Lord Gifford was representing 24 hippies and I just put my foot down and said this word is a racist word um, it is a word which is derogatory it is not accurate uh, it, and I don't think it should be used in this case and I think the jury then began and everyone else began to see these people as individuals who had individual integrity individual ideas about their lives and their children um, and they began to see the justice of their case and the injustice of the way they've been treated. If I could say that the bean field and um, what happened to me that day was the worst day of my life and I can't ever foresee having any, anything happen to me that could be worse than what happened to us there that day then I can say that that day that I had in the witness box must be my best day of my life as a, as a contrast, because it was such a good feeling to be able to stand up in public and say, no, this is how it happened, this is what happened to me, I'm telling the truth, and that did make me feel good. At the moment, the jury are considering their verdicts on allegations of strip searches. They'll then consider claims for damage to property and wrongful imprisonment. Kate Roberts, Coast to Coast, Winchester Crown Court. Can you just give me one shot of the court? Just help yeah. me. Now the problem arose when the jury answered the first question about the intentions of the convoy at the beginning of the day in favour of the police. And the last question, and some of the earlier ones, about the intentions of the convoy later in the day in favour of the plaintiffs. But the judge wouldn't accept that verdict. Um, and so eventually he said that he would pose another question to the jury. And the way the questionnaire was written was, quite frankly, uh, 
very it, it was very much against us right from the word go our lawyers tried to change it but um, they didn't succeed that well they couldn't get the judge to clarify matters and it was left so open that um, the judge was able to make the decision that he wanted to the final question that, that clinched ours question number 12 was did uh, members of the convoy still wish to force their way to Stonehenge at seven o'clock in the evening and they put the jury in in a terrible quandary. And the jury showed that they were in the quandary by sending a, a message to the judge saying we are puzzled by the words members of the convoy. Does it mean all the members or, some, or a few of the members or a section of the convoy? And the ju judge had them in and he said that it means any significant number in a sense, anything more than two or three. And that explains why, in the final result, the jury answered the question, yes, the police did reasonably believe that members of the convoy, some members of the convoy, still wanted to make trouble. And once they said that, the judge said, well, automatically, they're entitled to arrest everybody, and therefore the plaintiff's claim has failed, all of them. So that was, um, that was it, and I wouldn't... In fact, I know full well that it leaves a very sour taste in the mouth of both the jury and the plaintiffs because they feel that they secured the uh, verdict of the jury on the questions as they were put with everyone's agreement. Then the judge changed the goalposts. was proved to have been assaulted by uh, the policeman that arrested me and I was awarded money for that assault which was taken away in costs and the uh, policeman who assaulted me was promoted. That's British justice. That's exactly what happened. He got promotion and I'm still owing. I'm still in debt. But I pursued a case in the High Court to say in the, in the first place that I was unlawfully arrested. Um, that I didn't do anything wrong. I had no intention of doing anything wrong. I was being a responsible citizen, doing my level best to stop people getting hurt and patching them up when they had. And I was arrested. After all of this, six and a half years and several million pounds in legal costs, I have absolutely nothing to show for the wrong that um, the jury agreed had been done to me. If you get away from all the fine detail of the legal argument and exactly who said what to who in court and get to the bottom line, what happened in the bean field was an outrage. It should not have happened in a civilized society. And the people who did it, that's to say the police, appear largely to have got away with it. We couldn't just sit there and take it. You know, we were going to sit back and just have them destroy our lifestyle. We'd worked so hard over the years to establish ourselves and become part of, you know, almost try to become part of society again by saying this can be a normal way of life. This, you know, there is nothing wrong with the way we want to live. Please accept us. And we felt that we were, in a way, just beginning to reach that point with the wider society. And obviously the police and the state tried to stop us. And it was for that reason that I personally took action because I wasn't going to sit back and let them take my lifestyle away from me that easily. Irrespective of the rights and the wrongs of the actual issues on that day. Though obviously I felt the police were very wrong to have done what they did. But, but it wasn't that that made me sue them, it was the fact that I wasn't sitting back and taking it. I'm a fighter. Yeah, you can't stop. You can't stop. Running water. Running water. You can't kill. You can't kill. The fire that burns inside. After the break, Critical Eye continues with the Battle of Orgreave. Our flesh and blood. Our flesh and blood. Don't forsake. 
don't forsake our sons and daughters. Our sons and daughters. It's freedom of speech as long as you don't say too much. But sooner or later we're gonna realize we're gonna meet up with the truth face to face. I tell you, it's, it brings back some of the worst memories of my life. People don't understand what, what memories you have of that place unless they were actually there and they, they went through the experience. It gives you the shapes. Looking at it now and thinking back to the 18th of June 1984, that's the day and the place where my faith in British justice was gone, completely shattered. I was stood in the field with me back to lines and I saw everybody start to run up field. And as I turned around, all horses had come past and I fell on the floor. Then some uh, officers run over me. Then that fellow was showing up film and got me. I can't really remember much after that. Seven years ago, in our film The Battle for Orgreave, we exposed police brutality towards miners at the Orgreave coking plant. Using horses, dogs, and specially trained riot police, the state employed tactics never previously seen in this country. Adding insult to injury, many of the miners assaulted that day were charged with riot and faced possible life imprisonment. After 48 days in court, the prosecution case against the miners collapsed and all charges were dropped. It came out in the trial where officers had um, forged signatures on statements, perjured themselves under oath in the dock, and I've since learnt that no action has been taken against any of these officers. They're still on the beat. For all I know, arresting other people that are innocent, doing the self-same thing, perjury, having them sent to prison, ruining their lives, Something must be done about it to stop it. Earlier this year, South Yorkshire Police paid out £420,000 in damages to the miners for assault, malicious prosecution and false imprisonment. I think that what happened at Orgreave and I think the subsequent events which led eventually to the successful claims for compensation is not only an indictment of the police, it's far more an indictment of the system under which we live and central government. And I would like to see a public inquiry so that those responsible for the injury to many of the people at Orgreave, for the arrest that took place at Orgreave, and for the use of brutal force by the police at Orgreave should be brought to book. One came past here on his own, his house stood against the wall, he just run past, lashed out his truncheon, hit us on the eye, split me eye, and I just stopped pouring with blood. The police as a body should be answerable to somebody. Somebody should oversee what they do for whenever they step, overstep the mark. They are a law unto themselves, literally. They can assault you, perjure themselves in court, have you put in prison, like a few cases we've seen recently where people have been released after years on perjured evidence. And nothing ever comes of it. They're not answerable to anybody. An interview was arranged with Peter Hayes, the most senior officer still serving in the South Yorkshire Police, who was at Orgreave on the day. 
In the event, this was refused, although he was present throughout the interview with Richard Wells. Richard Wells had no responsibility for policing at Orgreave during the miners' strike. Are you aware if any disciplinary actions have been taken against any policemen who were present at Orgreave? So far as I know, no, none has been taken. I turned round and this police officer was about to hit me across the head with a truncheon. I ducked and somebody pulled me from behind at the same time and I went down like that. And he, he just missed me and I felt the truncheon go down past my side like that. I felt the wind of it. It was very quick and very frightening. It's not just miners, but other groups of people as well have been taking civil actions against authorities, police and others. And why are they doing this? Mainly because there has been no other remedy available. The victims have had to expose injustice, and they've done this by taking those actions. Police complaints authority, nothing. Not a single person even disciplined by any of the authorities. As he hit me, I fell into the car like that. I was coming up, he started, started hitting me with his truncheon. Why have no disciplinary actions been taken? Well, it's, it's not for want of enthusiasm on the part of investigating officers, which is often the charge. It's usually for want of evidence. Uh, the prosecution, the police in this particular case, has to prove beyond reasonable doubt that police officers have committed criminal offences or disciplinary offences. I think the authorities have not wanted to take action, is my view. They give their overt reasons is quality of evidence and that there's no identification. It's quite clear on these public disorder events, there's plenty of photographic evidence, whether it's film or stills. Plenty of independent witnesses who are not actually involved, who are witnessing what's going on. And that material has not been used. There's not been a will to do anything about it. What amazes me is where they've got it planned. They knew that they were going there to hurt people. And they deliberately did it. I mean, somebody, somewhere, told them what to do. They just knocked us into the floor. Basically, that, that's what happened. They got everybody there and then just beat them up. First day on picket line is this for this lad. And that's what he gets. I couldn't be 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 believe that people could be, be that lou lousy to other people, to be honest. The living today goes by where I don't think about it, really. It's, it's always in the back of your mind. It's got to be. It's, it's like losing money of parents, I suppose. It's something you never, you know, f f forget about. I was going, going, going out of my head, to be honest. I, I went to see a psychiatrist, and I used to think that phone was the absent. If phone used to ring, I used to, to take it off at wall and stand outside and think it out of them. Every time I saw a car go past, a police car, I used to think, how they're following me in. When I used to come down the backside, I, I used to think I had the weight in it dark, you know. I was going out of my head, really. The main lesson that the public should learn, and of course the police as uh, supposedly a service to the community, which is the way they like to see themselves now, is that there should be a very strong form of accountability. At the moment there is none. The Police Complaints Authority it, it does not carry out that function, nor does the Director of Public Prosecution. There is no independent control over the police whatsoever, and the time has come for someone to be overseeing the decisions that they take, and it has not to be a politician. It was to the, the, the right-hand side of me. I glanced over, and the next thing I saw was one of these uh, riot police with the riot shield hit him at the side of the arm and the face, and it just simply, it just, it just flattened him as if he, as if, as if he were a tree. He just simply flattened him to the floor, and I was flattened also. I was just flattened, and then about five, six police come, and they were kicking, punching, hitting with truncheons, and that's how I ended up with multiple bruising. You're always brought up to, to trust police, to put your trust in them even from a youngster, but now uh, I just have nothing to do with them. I don't even acknowledge them. Uh, I just think they're a, a governed force. They were told what to do by the government. They had the rights to do anything that day. Hit them with truncheons, uh, run them over with horses, hit them with batons, and it were all orchestrated. 
but the day was a victory for the police horses in the eyes of the rank and file policemen. They applauded and rattled their riot shields in tribute as the horses returned through their lines. The role of the media was very biased. Uh, it's, now, it's now emerging. The BBC have now actually admitted, seven years on, that there was footage taken at Orgreave, which was cut and rerun, so as to give the impression that the miners threw stones at the police prior to the police charging on horseback. In actual fact, the police charged and the miners responded in the only way they could to defend themselves. It was a mistake made in the haste of putting the news together. The end result was that an editor inadvertently reversed the occurrence of the actions of the police and of the pickets. I'm pleased to say that mistakes of this kind occur only very rarely. There have been scenes in Romania of miners throwing Molotov cocktails, pursuing the police with pickaxe handles, throwing bricks through government buildings. BBC News says to the British public, uh, they're only meeting out rough justice. The trouble continued for three hours before troops succeeded in lifting the siege of the building. The Romanian government is getting the rough justice it's dealt its opponents in the past. Would they have said the same? Did they say the same about Orgreave or any of the others? No, they didn't. Quite the reverse, principles are applied to British miners and there's double standards throughout. Innocent men who've been acquitted of riot and any suggestion of violence were branded thugs and bully boys by the media throughout the strike. Being, being treated as a criminal, imprisoned and beaten by police uh, for, for, well, for basically being on strike to save your job, it's, uh, it's wrong and it's a bitter pill. It's a bitter pill to swallow. It's something we'll never forget as long as we live. Uh, you know, I, I haven't told my children yet that I've been in prison and my wife didn't tell them then when I were in that I was in prison for fear of upsetting them. But uh, I'm sure when they're older and I tell them that I were in prison, I don't think that they'll walk with their heads down thinking their dad were a sort of convict, a thief or a rapist or whatever. I think they'll walk with their heads held high in the chest out and say, look, Arthur Critchlow's my dad and I'm, I'm proud of him. It's, uh... Terrible. The lad, Peter, I think, wasn't quite old enough to understand it. Um, my oldest daughter, Tara, was. And I think that she's quite proud that she's got a father that's got principles and stands by him, choose whatever happens. And that's the way I like to think I'm bringing him up, to stand by the principles and be honest. As soon as I got settled up, we went um, straight to the travel agents and booked a 16-day holiday in Jersey, somewhere I'd always wanted to go, and my wife. And uh, we'd said, if we won, then that's what we'd do a day at Jersey for every day spent in Ormley, Ormley Prison. And uh, off we went, me and my wife and family, and had a good time. Well, you've got to remember that uh, this dispute was different than most other disputes that's happened uh, in the past. I, this one was about jobs. It wasn't about money, it was about jobs and communities and saving pits. Unfortunately, the government wanted to close these pits, but you've got to say why, because they, be they basically stated their argument on economics. But over there, we've got Treaton Pit that's recently closed. Treaton Pit, all the coal used to come down into this coking plant. They've closed Treaton Pit, they've closed this coking plant. There's lots of other pits being closed. But if you look over there, you will see a huge open cast mine. Now, if they're talking about closing pits to take out productivity, and take out the amount of coal that we can produce. Why are they opening these things? What is all this about? I tell you, it's about the step to privatization. You know, and this is what we're gonna be careful of. That's what that's about, privatization and making money for a few people, basically in the city of London. This is a note from Ian McGregor, or oh, well, the then chairman of the National Coal Board. And I quote, this is his own words. This is a strike which should never have happened it is based on very serious misrepresentation and distortion of the facts. At great financial costs, miners have supported the strike 
for 14 weeks because your leaders have told you this that the coal board is out to butcher the coal industry that we plan to do away with 70,000 jobs that we plan to close down 86 pits and leave only 100 working collieries and I'll quote, these are, these are his own words, these. If these things were true, I would not blame miners for getting angry or for being deeply worried. But these things are absolutely untrue. I state that categorically and solemnly, you have been deliberately misled. Signed, yours sincerely, Ian McGregor, Chairman of National Coburn. biggest pack of lies I've ever read in my life. The National Coal Board uh, had a hit list of pit closures and when I said that they intended to close 70 pits and axe 70,000 jobs, the Tory government and Ian McGregor and the National Coal Board said I was telling lies. Uh, experience now demonstrates very clearly that I was telling the truth. The tragedy is that we've seen the devastation of the mining industry. We've had over 100 pit closures. We've had what, over 130,000 lost jobs and we've seen economic ruin. If nothing is changed, if nothing is done, then the size of the coal mining industry will go down to around 30 pits with around 30,000 people in readiness for privatization. This strike didn't just happen, it was planned as far back as 1978 when Tories commissioned a Tory MP, Nicholas Ridley, to make the Ridley report. It's never been publicized and it was the Tories' secret charter for privatisation. In Ridley report, it stated that the coal stocks must be built up, police riot units must be trained, scab lorry drivers must be recruited, and this come about in 78. We have a government who will lie to the country, will lie to the people. They lied to the people for a year during our strike. Margaret Thatcher, Peter Walker, and other senior Tory ministers all said the government weren't involved in the strike. It wasn't a political strike, it was an industrial dispute. It has now emerged that the government were pulling the strings all along. Ian McGregor has written a book, admitted uh, the government's part in the dispute. They've been proved to be liars. I think it's important that we recognise exactly what the state's position was going to be on the miners' strike, in that we were called the enemy within. Um, they said they were going to do a job on us, they were going to smash us. Uh, they actually openly came out and said that. They didn't want to actually defeat a trade union strike. What they wanted to do was smash the trade union movement. The miners were the most militant in the tra within the trade union movement, so the miners had to be taken on first. If they could smash the miners, then the rest of the trade union movement would fall like a house of cards. The battle for Orgreave, as it's been so-called, wasn't just about the miners. It was about the steel industry, it was about power workers. But unfortunately, the workers at Orgreave chose to work through the miners' strike, producing coal. And thanks they received for that, or for the Conservative government, for redundancy. At Orgreave, us miners, we experienced firsthand the full power at state against industrial workers. And if people think that it will only be used against miners or people on peace rallies, they better open their eyes up a little bit because this government will use it against anyone to get their own means. They practised. They practised in Ireland, they practised in Brixton and Toxteth. And when it was our turn, they perfected the techniques and they used them to great effect on us. There has been, since about 1981, groups of police officers in police support units training, training to incapacitate demonstrators. Their training has been derived from a manual which surfaced during this trial for the first time, a manual devised by ACPO, the Association of Chief Police Officers. There were serious acts of violence by senior and junior police officers in charge of short shield units. Units that had never before been used before the 18th of June. Those units were out of control. 
Police training began with experiments in Hong Kong, then on the streets of Belfast, now presently in Riot City and Hounslow, and obviously experimentation during the miners' strike. And what they've learned is to develop and refine those techniques and increase the amount of weaponry at their disposal leading up to the use of armed response vehicles on the streets of London this year. And what is most reprehensible is that the tactics that they're using are not exposed, no, they're not subject to public debate, nobody really knows what they're doing. And that is because the organisation that drew up the original manual, ACPO, effectively is a state within a state. They have control of this manual, nobody knows what's in it, nobody knows what safeguards there are. And until that is made public, we'll have these techniques going on and subject to no review. Up until Orgreave on the 18th of June, We'd been, every attempt to get to pits and to get to power stations, there'd been roadblocks, we'd been stopped. Except on the 18th of June, that was different. We were led to this field. All the miners were ushered in, we, we, we were shown the way, the police brought us here. And I, I recall I was sat exactly around this area, and there was around 8,000 police, all with the riot shields. And really it was a lull, there was nothing going on there, and no one expected anything to happen from the police at that time. But the police obviously needed something to happen. You know, they brought us here, they put us into this field. Why? We were largely in a reactive situation. Um, at the small pits, um, we might have seen six pickets. We would see six police officers without riot gear and the rest. Um, at Orgreave, we were reacting to a large number of pickets there and demonstrators who wanted to stop the workers going in. So largely, we were reactive. I was proud of what, a great deal of what I saw. Additionally, I was ashamed of some other things that I saw and always took steps to take action in respect of that. But overall, in the situation in which we were placed, I can say hand and heart that we did a good job in the circumstances. I don't believe in public order situations. There has been policing by intervention and reaction only. There is a very clear strategy, and it's a common theme is in fact a form of intimidation, namely that is putting people, large numbers of people, in confined spaces and surrounding them by police so they wish they'd never gone on demonstrations. And what's the object of that? I believe there's a very clear political object. They want to prevent any form of peaceful mass demonstration in this country. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the European Convention, both enshrine the right to peaceful assembly and peaceful association. This government, through its Public Order Act, has emasculated that right. And it's done it by allowing the police to determine the extent to which that right will be exercised, namely, how many people shall gather together for how long and where. And that proposal, which was enacted in 1986, since Orgreave, effectively reduces the right to nothing. Given what's happened in Europe over the same period of time, and the way in which regimes have been challenged by public demonstration, can the British public imagine a quarter of a million people being allowed to assemble to demonstrate against this government? Absolutely not. The answer is the European Convention should be implemented and recognised in the British courts. There should also be internal domestic legislation by the British government enshrining the right to peaceful assembly and association. That would provide in turn legal remedies that could be pursued in the courts so individuals are protected by law.